Welcome to Linda's Corner. My name is Linda Bjork, and today we're going to be talking about how certain foods can benefit your mental health. I'm excited to welcome special guest Shelly Clay, who lives in an oasis on the edge of the Sahara Desert. Shelly is a businesswoman, an organic mompreneur, who is a passionate advocate for mental health and opportunities for women. And I'll include a link to her website, puredate.com, in the description. Welcome, Shelly. I'm so glad you could join with me today. Thank you. Oh, Shelly, I am so excited to be able to be talking to you. And I have so many questions. First of all, why are you in an oasis on the edge of the, of the Sahara <laughs> Desert? That is a great question. If you would have asked me 10 years ago if I would be here, I would have told you there's no way. Um, so it is a long story, but we have time. We got time. So if you're willing to hear it, yeah, I'll, um, I'll just kind of give you the rundown of how we ended up on the edge of the Sahara desert running a business. So it all began, uh, when my family and I, we moved to North Africa in 2015 to run a language business along the coast of Tunisia, uh, sort of in the middle of the country. And after about four years of growing this business, we took a trip to the Sahara Desert in the south of the country, and we visited a date oasis town. And it was during the, the harvest season in the fall, and at that time, all the locals would come up to our car and they would pass dates through the window for us to try. Uh, they're just such generous and kind people there. Um, and we hadn't really eaten many dates before this. I think at, around this time, dates was kind of becoming more popular in the States, but before I hadn't seen them in the stores very often. And I was amazed that such delicious and sweet fruit would thrive in the middle of an otherwise barren Sahara desert. So as I asked more questions while we were there, I realized that not all the dates were being sold or shipped off for export, but that each year up to 20% of the dates didn't make it to the market due to cosmetics. Oh, that's a lot. Uh, yeah, and they were either being thrown away or they were used for animal feed because what happens is um, when it rains, which it doesn't very often, but every once in a while it does, it'll damage the date on the tree. And because it's not pretty, then they can't sell it. And so there's absolutely nothing wrong with the date at all. It tastes the same. It's organic, everything. But uh, it's Interesting. Not pretty, so. so I can imagine that you we want like for export and things like that, but even the locals aren't eating them? Right. Yeah. They, they feed them to their animals, but oftentimes, you know, since I've lived down there, I realized that the animals aren't really even eating them. There will be piles of them that the animals haven't touched. So wow, that's it's so really sad. mostly being wasted. So yeah. So the more time we spent in the oasis on the edge of the Sahara desert, the more we, I, I would fall in love with it. The desert, it's just a really beautiful place in its own regard. And it's really an ideal ambience for spiritual reflection, too. And I have three little ones. And in this crazy, busy um, time of life, I just really kind of appreciate a more uh, a slow pace. I know we go back to the States and um, things are crazy. And, you know, moms have their kids in every club. And I would come back to the desert and just, like, really... Um, thankful yeah, that we don't have all of those <laughs> options oh, but just it's a, it's exhale, a really cool place. just <sighs> yeah it is exactly so I felt so much peace there and I wanted to find a way to bless the vibrant people that we were meeting so God brought to mind a way that we could do this while we were caring for my nephews so I'll have to rewind a little bit um, and tell you some of the backstory. So shortly after we moved overseas, my sister needed help caring for her two boys. They were ages nine and 11 at the time mm -hmm. because she was active in the military. And my nephews, because they didn't know Arabic at that time, they moved in with us. They couldn't go to the local schools. So I took up homeschooling them. And uh, one of my nephews, he really struggled with school because of due to ADHD. And I wanted to help him be able to focus and to have less emotional mood swings throughout the day due to frustration. And at the time, he was taking a pretty heavy dose of Ritalin uh, just in order to help him keep focus in school. And I didn't like how it changed his personality. Oh, so that's when I started, re started doing some research, anything I could about ADHD. Um, and I looked for some more natural ways to support him. So many, many of the research studies that I stumbled on discussed how diets and specifically how sugar can actually impact mood swings and the symptoms associated with ADHD. 
and I had discovered date sugar while on our trip to the desert, but it was hard to find in country as well as in the States. So I experimented in my own kitchen with making date sugar from upcycled dates. So I would dry them out in the sun and I would grind them into the consistency of sugar with my coffee grinder because I wanted to keep them minimally processed. And I would start to substitute date sugar in recipes whenever a recipe would call for white sugar or brown sugar. And I was really shocked actually. Um, to my surprise, I discovered that it's, it's really tasty. It sort of has like a caramel like flavor. It's good for baking as well as cooking. It goes in, um, it's good for like Asian sauces. It's very versatile. So the more research I did, I discovered like the dates are a super fruit and that they're loaded with lots of nutritious fiber. They have like 45 times the antioxidants of honey. Wow. There's more potassium in one ounce of a date than there is in an ounce of a banana. Hmm. And it has iron in it too. So a lot of these sugar replacements that you find on the market now, um, they don't have, they're not full, full of nutrition because no. this is a totally plant-based sugar. So for me, this was paradigm shifting. Um, instead of feeling guilty about feeding my kids sugar, I could actually give them something good and feel feel good about giving it to them because it was good for their bodies. And, and two, an added benefit was because it comes from a fruit, it digests slowly. So it has a low glycemic index. And so my nephew went and experienced that unwanted sugar crash you know, that we can get from processed sugars Absolutely. and even sweeteners like honey that have the potential to be all natural, but they have a higher glycemic index. Do you know what I mean by glycemic index? I don't know. if. Yeah. Do you want to explain? I mean, it's just basically yeah. the way that the body handles it, the way it responds to it, right? Right. It's the way in which the sugar is released into the blood, the, the bloodstream. And so a lot of sugars that most sugars that we eat have a high glycemic index and carbs. It comes from carbs um, and it's released quickly into the bloodstream. And so um, the slower it's released, it means it gives you energy um, at a, uh, it doesn't give you a surge of energy and then you crash, but it gives you a consistent amount of energy over a longer period of time. And it's, it's really um, ideal for people with diabetes, especially. So so with that, I tr started trying to focus on incorporating whole foods into our diets uh, for my nephew mainly, but I felt actually the change in my own body and in my family too. Um, they, we really started sort of just adopting this lifestyle of eating healthier and eating whole foods. And in doing this, we cut out all the white processed sugar and it really increased my nephew's ability to focus. And we were able to cut down on his medication by four times. That's fantastic. It really was. And and we were able to catch up two years, two years worth of school in one year. Wow. And we, we saw far less emotional outbursts from him throughout the day. So what was cool about this is that we could still have fun rewards in our house. We could have cookies because they were made with date sugar. And that's when I knew we had a winning product. And it's really the best kept secret, I think, of all time because – you know, we didn't want to keep this to ourselves. We wanted to share it with the world. And I wanted to let moms know everywhere that they're not alone in this sugar struggle and that there's truly a better alternative out there. So um, my husband and I were both really driven people, people and were entrepreneurially minded. So we decided to move our family south, five hours south from where we started and leave the language business uh, someone else took that over and we moved to the small desert town where the dates come from. And we did this intentionally so that we could share hope with the people that we met there, with the sweet people we were falling in love with. Uh, instead of taking the work and the jobs away from an economically neglected place, I wanted to focus on being a blessing to our local community. So through our company called Pure Date, um, we're able to make a real and tangible difference in people's lives by living there. And some of the ways that we do that, we provide um, year-long meaningful employment with benefits. Um, and that's not the norm where we live. Uh, we pay above the average wage in an area where unemployment is high. Typically, uh, women will work seasonally just in the fall when they harvest the dates. And then they won't have work the rest of the year. And wow. the men too as well. 
And so this um, gives jobs into the community where they really need it. And most of our employees are women trying to earn a living for their families. And we want to empower them to make a brighter future possible for them and for their children. Absolutely. So that's one of the things that keeps us motivated. (laughs) Wow. So many amazing things. Oh, my gosh. So how are you able to provide year-long um, employment when, I mean, you only pick the dates when they're ready. Do, uh, do they ripen at a certain season or are they all year? I, I don't have dates by my house. I don't know what <laughs> normal is. Yeah, not many people do. So, um, yeah, so they, yeah, they ripen. And then in the fall, so they have to be in extremely hot temperatures. Like right now, it's like 120 degrees. And so, yeah, they have to be in extremely hot temperatures. And then in the fall, when it cools off a bit, that's when they're ready to be picked. And so they're picked and they're stored. Um, A lot of them are refrigerated and they're stored until we need them. So we have a constant supply of dates coming through our factory. Oh, okay. So you have enough dates stored that you can do the process of turning it into sugar year round. Is that correct? Exactly. Yes. Okay. That is brilliant. That would be a really big fridge. (laughs) It is (laughs) probably bigger than your house. (laughs) Wow. That is fantastic. Oh my gosh. Okay, so, so many things to talk about. Your story is incredible. What you're doing is amazing. I love how every aspect of what you're doing benefits people. It's doing the upcycling of food, which is something I had to look up. When I read through your thing, I had to look up many words. I thought, oh my, there are so many things I don't know. But the idea of upcycling is like like what you did where you take something, food, that would otherwise be wasted and find ways to, to use it and make it be useful. So that food upcycling is brilliant in eliminating waste. And I love that you're giving back and helping your community to be able to be more prosperous. I love that you're working with women and helping to improve their lives. And I love that it benefits our bodies and helps people and then you did the, talked about the whole ADHD thing. It's just like, oh my gosh, where do you want to start? This is incredible. <laughs> yeah, and it helps the farmers too. I'll say that. It doesn't just um, waste dates, but it helps the farmers because the farmers aren't going to get any money or very little money from the 20% of their crop or whatever that doesn't make it. So this also helps them. Of course. And that makes perfect sense because before they had 20% of the product that was just basically a write-off. Mm-hmm. So exactly. that is amazing. Well, let's talk about, can we talk about em- women and employment and what it is like where you are? What, what is the standard of living for, for a, a normal family? Can you specify um, exactly what you mean by standard of living? Like, what kind of house do they live in, or how much do they make a month, or... That is a good question. I guess it encompasses <laughs> everything, doesn't it? So, in a, in a day-to-day, like, what kind of house, and what kind of food, and what kind of clothes... So, when you talk about how there is only employment for a few months in the year, how do you mm. make that last throughout... Because we have to live... We, we don't get to stop eating just because we stopped, you know, picking the fruit or doing whatever our job was. So what do people eat? Where where does the water come from? Where does their food, do they grow stuff? I mean, how do you, Uh how do you live when you're only working a couple (laughs) months? Like, I just don't understand. Yeah. Well, you can't grow much down in the desert and you can grow dates and a few other things, but, um, most of our produce comes from the North. Um, yeah. And I want to be respectful in talking about them because I'll, I'll give you a quote that one person, one friend told me that lives close to me, he said, um, uh, there's not poor people and there's not rich people in here. There's just, we're all just people. Um, And living in Africa, I've learned one thing, and that's that uh, people live in community. They're, they're, They're very communal instead of individualistic. And so they always live with families. There's family units. So there'll be the grandparents and then maybe the sons that live with them. Typically, Uh, they'll build a house on top of their house, like a second story and even a third story for their sons for when they get married and they have children, they move in above them. Now, the the daughters, they don't do that because the daughters go and live with whoever they marry. 
And so oftentimes when they share meals, they share them all together and they share resources. And so if someone is in need in your family, is in need of money, then you have your family to go to and your family is actually in some ways obligated to help you out. And so I think that's how over many generations, um, people have lived in Africa and survived in Africa. And I know that's kind of hard for us to understand because if we have, say, a cousin that comes to us and they're like, oh, I, I need money to buy a car or I need money for my wedding. And we, we may not we may not feel like it's our responsibility to give them money to do that. But here it's an honor, shame culture. And so if you do not give money to your relative or to your friend who's asking for help, then you are looked at with shame and they don't want to be shamed. But then they also expect that favor in return when they're in need, they'll go to you and say, we need this. And so I think that's kind of how life works here. And people really, I've, I've learned to how to rely on my neighbors. And I'll tell you, it's a really cool thing because it can be like, I'm really busy one day and I just, I'm not having time to make supper. And, and where we live, there's not like restaurants. You just go out and eat at. You don't have a lot of options. Mm -hmm. um, you mostly cook every meal in your home. And there'll be like a day where this has happened to me recently where I was really busy and I, I didn't get, um, I didn't, I didn't get time to cook dinner or I didn't have the food that I needed to cook dinner. And a neighbor would just come over and just bless me with an abundance of food that she had just freshly prepared. Oh, that's and beautiful. Yeah. It's amazing. It moves your heart. Cause it's like, thank you that I needed this and my family needed this. Now the next night, you might return her plate full of food because you never return a plate empty. Uh -huh. So any dish that she gives you, you make sure that you pile it full of food and send it back to her, that is which is really lovely. kind of a cool giving and receiving thing that goes on. Oh, that's lovely. So what kinds so of things go on the plate? Is it is it rice? Is it beans? Is it, I mean, what kinds of food do you prepare? <laughs> Cookies this has with been dates. a challenge for me, Linda. This has been one of the hardest parts of living here because I'll make something that my family really loves that we make in America, and I'll send it to them, and they're not shy to say that they didn't like it. <laughs> 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 and they'll tell me that to my face, believe it or not, which is actually I really appreciate because I'm like, okay, now I won't make that again. At least you didn't just go home and throw it away and tell me you didn't like it, you know? Um, but they make a lot of stews. So are you, of, are you allowed to say that when they bring you something and you don't like it? I don't. Okay. <laughs> even if I might be allowed to say it, I don't say it. I say, oh, thank you. Even if I don't like it. Cause there are some things that are hard to eat. Harissa has become a really popular thing in the States, uh, recently in the last few years. And that is, we eat a lot of harissa here. It's just basically red peppers crushed up, mixed with olive oil, and there might be some other spices in it. I'm not sure because I've never made it, but um, that's their that's one of their main staples. Staples, and they eat a lot of uh, bread because bread is really cheap and it's subsidized. So for breakfast, their meal might just be a baguette and a glass of milk if they're lucky, you know. And they may or like some of the more wealthy families may have like meat on the weekend, a fish or a lamb. Lamb is uh, something that they eat a lot of in the desert. We eat a lot of camel uh, often. Oh, really? Um, that's all you can find at the butcher. What does <laughs> camel, camel taste like? <laughs> um, it's okay if you marinate it, but it's pretty tough if you don't. So you need to marinate it for a while and then you can grill it and it's, it's pretty yummy. One of our favorite things to do is go out um, on the, on the dunes, on the sand dunes that are about just like really in our backyard, but we drive out a little ways um, to the sand dunes and we'll have a campfire at night. And I don't know if you've ever seen the stars at night in the desert, mm -hmm. but it's absolutely the most beautiful stargazing I've ever seen. And it's, it's just really fun. And I don't know if you know, um, but Star Wars, some of the earlier episodes of Star Wars were filmed uh, just about 10 minutes from our house. Oh, how fun. Uh, there's maybe four or five sites uh, around where we live 
And so those sites are still there and people come and, and see those for tourism. And so we do have some tourism, although tourism has been hard since COVID. For sure. It sounds quite lovely. A beautiful, beautiful sense of community, a beautiful sense of enjoying nature, you know, and gazing at the stars and mm. enjoying simple pleasures in life. I think that is lovely. So that's amazing. What a wonderful contribution that you are creating and doing. That's fantastic. So I have to ask, what kind of cookies do you make? Are we talking chocolate chip or is it some kind of special thing or? <laughs> well, you should check out all of our re recipes on our website. Yes, um, I it is should. Chocolate chip. And you can make other cookies too, not just chocolate chip, but I think that might be the only one I've posted on the website so far. Um, but they, they are yummy. Yeah. Can, does it is it just like one for one, like cup for cup for regular granulated sugar and and that kind of thing? I mean, if you were to it's substitute, it's actually not. No, um, yeah. So I spent about a year and a half developing the recipes that we have, and that was the tricky part. And I think that's what discourages people from using date sugar because I think they just try the one for one ratio and it doesn't it doesn't turn out how their normal recipe right. they like their normal cake recipe that grandma's used for that they've used for years um so if when when baking with date sugar what you want to do is you want to decrease the the flour the dry ingredients by about 25 percent and then add some moisture so an egg or water or whatever liquid that you're using and um that's why we posted these website, these recipes, because uh, we want people to know how to use the sugar and not be discouraged when they take it home and they're like, I don't know how to use it. So if you're a new, uh, new to using date sugar, I would just suggest like sprinkle it over your oatmeal, put it in your smoothies because it's a good source of fiber and it sweetens your smoothies. Um, you can put it in some natural Greek yogurt and use it as a dip with with fruit with um you can sprinkle it over your grapefruit those are just some very simple ways to use it and then once you feel confident using it in those ways then you can venture and make cookies and bake cupcakes and things like that um but it's not gonna give you the sweetness that white sugar gives you which is okay and i think um i think a lot of us and what i have tended to do in the past is i'm like okay I'm going to go on a no sugar kick for 30 days. And so I don't eat sugar for 30 days. I torture myself. And then after the 30 days, I go back to sugar thinking, okay, I'm going to like, going to be more under, this is going to be more under control. I'm not going to eat as much sugar as I used to because I have a really bad sweet tooth. Um, and then I go back to sugar and I'm like, oh, this was just as good as it was before. <laughs> this is not helping. So, so I think what date sugar does is you start using it and at first you're like, okay, this is not a super, super sweet, but it's sweet. And then you just keep using it and you keep adjusting and your family adjusts to it. And then when I go back to the States and I eat some something that somebody made, brownies or cake or whatever and I taste it and I'm like whoa this is super sweet so what's happened is my palate has changed over time mm -hmm. and the whole thought about this is maybe my children if I if I introduce this to them at a young age as they grow older they're not going to have the battle with sweets that I've had as an adult because they're not used to that kind of sweetness and they don't need that kind of sweetness and sugar right. really is addictive. White sugar is addictive. It and really the more is. you have it, the more you want it. And that's just not a good thing because no. for many, many, many reasons. <laughs> no, that is amazing. I love all the things that you're sharing and how much time and effort you've put in. I have, uh, I mean, I haven't done it with the date sugar, but I have a little bit of an understanding because I also have a child with ADHD. And as we also studied and researched and tried to figure out how to help him, and came to the same conclusion, because truth is truth, that sugar and what you eat very much affects behavior. And so trying to come up with new recipes, trying to come up with new ways of doing things was very, very challenging. And for, it seemed like a year and a half, my entire life was in the kitchen trying to figure out how to feed my family and still make it taste good and have sane children. 
And mm. so your your efforts, I just appreciate so much. And I'm so excited to be able to look on that website and to be able to check out those recipes because I am sure they are hard won recipes where it took lots and lots of trial and error and getting things to work. So thank you for your efforts to help make it so that other people can kind of stand on your shoulders, so to speak, and, and start right away with a little bit of success. And that's the hope, really. We just want to empower moms and not just moms, but people all over the world to change their lifestyle. We're very holistic when when we look at this. We really believe, we say that behind and in front of every package of date sugar is a transformed life. And that's that's what we desire we want to sweeten the lives of everyone we come into contact with. That's kind of our tagline is pure date, making lives sweeter. And that's what we aim to do. So, um, and I think we don't realize how much sugar is in absolutely everything we eat almost like we no. don't see it. And like when I was young, I think my mom, I don't know if she ever looked at the ingredients on things. I mean, we had Kool-Aid and chocolate milk every morning for breakfast and <laughs> you know all of these things and now now I'm much more I think everyone now is looking at labels and they're realizing that there is sugar in everything and so yeah just being more mindful of of what we put into our bodies and especially since COVID I think a lot of children a lot of people are struggling with anxiety mm -hmm. and so I think people are looking for more natural ways to heal their bodies and not just medicine. And I'm not, I'm not saying medicine is not necessary. Um, my no, nephew, he not. still took, um, 10 milligrams of Ritalin because he needed that, but we did cut back quite a bit. That's and that fantastic. was the goal. That's amazing. And I love how you talk about anxiety and that watching what we eat can also help with that. Sometimes we think, oh, well, our physical and our mental and our emotional, they're, they're separate and they don't touch. But in the reality, when we work on one, it helps with the other. And when we work on what we eat, it helps affect the way that we feel. And it helps us to feel more empowered, which is a, a beautiful, beautiful thing. Exactly. And we don't have to become obsessed with it. You know, I think sometimes we can make food an obsession. And this is just, it's not a zero calorie sugar. It has calories. It has a third less calories than white sugar, but it has calories because our body needs calories. We don't, I think, you know, sometimes we can not consume enough calories throughout the day. And then we're like really hungry all day and we're wondering why we're binge eating at night. Right. <laughs> so we don't, we don't want to make food like the ultimate thing that we think about all the time. And this is just a really no. good way to be able to enjoy sweet things in a healthy way. And it's possible. So I think that's a, a really cool thing that we just want to share with the world. That is amazing. So besides your website, where else can we find your wonderful product? So right now we're on Amazon. That's probably the easiest way. You can also buy our product, yeah, on the website. Um, but also through Amazon. So it's pure date and pure is without the E. So it's P U R D A T E sugar. And it's all one word. Pure date is all one word. That is fantastic. And our website's the same pure date.com. Amazing. Well, thank you for what you're doing. I, I love it. I love that you're helping your family. You're helping your community and then reaching out to help the world. It, it's just inspiring. Thank you, Linda. And thank you for having me. Oh, thank you for visiting with me today. It has been enlightening. In closing, I'd like to share a quote from the ancient Greek physician Hippocrates. He said, let thy food be thy medicine, and thy medicine shall be thy food. Today, I invite you to make good food choices so your food can be a medicine to your body and your mind. See you next time on Linda's Corner.